Samah for inviting me, the chairpersons for the nice invitation. Now, uh, yesterday, the one of my friends told me that you need 15 minutes to talk about morphine and fentanyl. It's too long uh, lecture. وأنا طلبت من الدكتور سامح إن أنا أغير عنوان التوبيك from pain management to the role of pain physician. I will try to cover this topic in the following points. Our role in arrhythmia management. This publication عيان عمل ما فيش حاجة طالعة منه. عمل كابج سيرجري after three days he get an electric storm and he received pharmacotherapy failed pharmacotherapy failed DC shock he received. 70 DC shocks, 7 0, complete failure. They do for him stellate ganglion blockade, and the result was immediate stabilization from single shot stellate ganglion block. So, when I read this, I think this is a computer error. But when, <coughs> when I go to the publications, I find a lot of publication talking about the stellate ganglia in the management of arrhythmia. Single shot stellate ganglion block. Bilateral stellate ganglion blockade, continuous stellate ganglion blockade, as well as stellate ganglia combined with bilateral sympathetic denervation. A systematic review and a meta analysis, another systematic review, so a lot of publication about the use of stellate ganglia in the management of ventricular fibrillation. Finally, it is a concept that has been approved. Now, the question is what is effective? Is the local anesthetics? more effective or radio frequency more effective. So now I'm thinking in a human error, not a computer error. So I ask two questions to myself. Is it logic to do stellate ganglia for the management of arrhythmia? This is the first question, and we have to go to the physiology. <coughs> Sorry, we have to know the sympathetic and sensory supply to the heart. <coughs> uh, all of us know that the sympathetic coming from the spinal cord relay in sympathetic ganglia and goes to the heart. The first thoracic and inferior cervical ganglia are called the stellate ganglia. So the sympathetic supply coming from the spinal cord to the corresponding ganglia and ending to the heart. The most important point is that a sensory afferent coming from the heart, going to the spinal cord, going to the brain, is in association with the sympathetic. It's not only sympathetic, it is sympathetic as well as a sensory impulse. This will occur at the level of T5, T4, T3, T2, and T1, which is the inferior part of stellate, inferior cervical, middle, and superior cervical ganglion. So when we talk about the stellate ganglion blockade that is effective in the management of arrhythmia, we should deposit our local anesthetic at the stellate ganglion, aiming that this local anesthetic spreading down to T5 segment. If it did not spread downward, it will not be effective as well as it goes up to include the middle and superior cervical ganglia. In bilateral cardiac sympathetic denervation, it is another surgical procedure. They remove the lower four, uh, uh, T5, T4, T3, T2, and the lower half of T1 surgically. This is a very major operation, needs expert surgeon, expert anesthesiology, one lung anesthesia. And unfortunately, if you go to the literature, they did left sympathetic denervation surgically, and the patient did not improve. After three days, they are going to do right sympathetic denervation. So a lot of uh, invasive procedure has been done. So the answer of the question, yes, it is logic and very desirable to do stellate ganglia for the management of DF. The second question, is it an easy block? Can the intensifist do this block or not? When you look to the ultrasound of the neck, most of intensivists are looking to the internal jugular vein, looking for the venous state and uh, the fluid status of the patient. But we, as a pain physician, we have a different look. We are looking to the prevertebral fascia as well as the longus coli muscle. And if we are looking here, we have the longus coli muscle. Above it, in blue line, is the fascia of the muscle. Above it is the pretracheal fascia. And in between the two lines is the stellate ganglia. So, Samer Naruzi, an Egyptian guy that worked as a chronic pain physician in Cleveland, summarized the safety and efficacy of ultrasound guided stellate ganglion blockade. And this is the exact location where you have to insert your needle. So, do an ultrasound, you will see the pretracheal fascia, the longer coli muscle, and you inject your local anesthetic. 
giving a big volume, aiming to go down to T5 segment, uh, uh, T5 ganglia, and going up to superior cervical ganglia. So it's easier than doing in uh, internal jugular cannulation. It is very easy. Junior residents in our department do the still ganglion blockade routine. But to see the extension downward, we cannot follow the extension of local athletic with ultrasound. We have to do in chronic pain fluoroscopy to see their extension downward, but I think this will not be applicable in patient with VF. So the question, this plot is very easy to do, and the intensivist should learn it to do it to save a lot of patients. Now when you are talking about pain management, you have to define pain. It is unpleasant, sensory and emotional. So it's not a sensory only, it has an emotional component. And this emotional component, we see it in the post-traumatic stress disorders of our patient and the IC syndrome in our doctors. We have a nerve ending, these nerve endings ends in the tissue. So if you have a tissue injury, not an in in nerve injury, you get what's called nociceptic pain. If you have a nerve injury, you got a neuropathic pain. They are totally two different types of pain. Each has its own lines of treatment. And they're a mixture, usually pain is a mixture of both, and their composition is about 100. So a lot of drugs that intensive, they are using routinely, are strong analgesics. I will start with the first one, which is magnesium sulfate. And magnesium has a site in the N-missile diaspartate receptor in the brain, which is responsible for exacerbation of pain. So it is, magnesium is a lambda receptor blocker, so it is a strong analgesic drug. And ketamine, which all of us remember it as an athetic drug. Actually, we have two types of ketamine, anesthetic ketamine and the analgesic dose of ketamine. In anesthesia, we give the patient two cc, a single shot immediately to the patient. But in analgesia, we give one cc over 24 hours. It is a very, very low dose. It's about 30 mics per kg per hour. So it will not put the patient in the side effects of a ketamine that all of you know. Ketamine has a site in the NAMDA receptor. So again, it is a NAMDA receptor blocker, so it is a strong analgesic drug. The combination of ketamine and magnesia is very important because magnesium prevents the channel to be open, and ketamine will close the already open channels that escape with the effect of magnesium. So they have a sequential effect to each other. So the third drug is dexmetomidine, and all of us know that is presynaptic alpha-2 agonist, decreasing the discharge of uh, norepinephrine from the presynaptic ganglia, and depending on its site, if it is in the cardiovascular system, produce bradycardia and hypotension, in the brain, sedation and exulasis, as well as analgesia, in the kidney, it might produce diuresis. So the most important point about dexmetomidine that it produces natural sleep, if we give midazolam or benzodiazepine, the patient might obstruct and will get into serious complications. But with dexmetomidine, rarely patients obstruct. So it's very important. So I believe three syringe pumps could be uh, adjusted for every patient to control both nociceptive as well as neuropathic pain. Lidocaine, which is an important drug for arrhythmia, it is important for treatment of neuropathic pain in the same dose, continuous infusion. So non-steroidals and opiates and steroids could be used at a lower dose to avoid the, the hazardous effect both on the kidney and on the conscious state of the patient. Now we are getting to the third point, which is the nerve blocks. We have to know each intensivist can do three nerve blocks very easily to control all the type of the patient. blocks in Anyway, we put the ultrasound probe above the clavicle. We put the ultrasound immediately above the clavicle. We will see the recording in progress. We will see the subclavian artery and on its lateral aspect, a honeycomb appearance of the brachial plexus. So single injection with a needle, you will get a complete analgesia and even anesthesia in the upper limb, which is very important, lot of patients. 
In the lower limb, in the middle of the thigh, there is an adductor canal and injecting local anesthetics into the saphenous vein the, uh, lateral to the artery will get analgesia to most of the lower limb. And the third block, which is called erectospinal plane block. And it is a very important block and then has been summarized in such publication. It is the only block you need to know. One block solves a lot of problems. And here, you feel the spinous process of the thoracic vertebrae, go one centimeter lateral, go with your needle perpendicular, so now you are hitting the lamina of the bone. Now you are injecting the drugs, the drugs will be under the erectospinal muscles, they block the posterior primary ramus, they relieve the spasm of the muscles, which is usually a major problem. Injecting more dose, the local anesthetics goes into paravertebral space, blocking the spinal nerves themselves, and producing a strong analgesia. If you inject 30 mLs, you will get eight levels in the thoracic segment and four levels in the lumbar segment. So you can get a thoracic analgesia if you inject at T5. You get abdominal analgesia if you do your injection at T10 level, and you can get a pelvic analgesia again. A lot of publication about this block in multiple rib fracture, in weaning for mechanical ventilation for patients with multiple fracture ribs. It is very effective in all operations, whether this breast surgery, thoracic, lumbar surgery, uh, abdominal surgery, cesarean section, or even hip arthritis. Now, intensivists are more lucky because the radio frequency, which should be invasive long time ago, it's become nowadays non-invasive. And the third, uh, the second generation non-invasive uh, radio frequency now is available. I have talked about this publication, which is effective. The local anesthetics or radio frequency. So radio frequency used a lot of times for neuromodulation of our nerves. So these are simple machines. The idea is you have an active and passive electrode, a radio frequency current of about one million cycles per second coming from the active, hitting the passive, returning to the active. This, this will create two things, a radio frequency current as well as internal heating of the tissues. This heat is adjusted by the machine, so here we are adjusted at the same problem. Here we adjust the temperature at 37, as you see with red lines, and the temperature of the patient is only 30, so we need more time to get the desired temperature, and this temperature is controlled also by the machine. These radio frequency waves will work on both bones, muscles, tendons, and ligaments, as well as fat. So they are working on peripheral tissues, improving nociceptive pain. So they relieve nociceptive pain efficiently. At the same time, they work on nerves. So they relieve neuropathic pain, and they can be used as a neuromodulator for a lot of nerves in our body and can be helpful in management of our problems. Again, it vasodilates our vessels, so it's very important in ischemic pain. So as you see, this non-invasive could solve the problem of both nociceptive, neuropathic, as well as ischemic pain. These are the type of the probes. So imagine that we can work on all sympathetic ganglia in our body. In the cervical region, we can work on the inter. In the cervical region, we can work on the inferior, middle, and superior cervical ganglia. In the thoracic region, we are fortunately lucky because the thoracic ganglia are present on the lateral aspect. So putting this plate, putting this plate in the axilla, it will face the thoracic ganglia in the thoracic region. In the abdomen, the ganglia in the anterolateral aspect of the vertebrae. So if you are looking from the abdominal side, you will see the, uh, the ganglia here. If you are putting the plate, you can stimulate bilaterally the sympathetic ganglia. So I would like to conclude that pain should be treated in every patient. It is the right of every patient. And the pain specialist should not enter into the intensive care. I believe the blocks and the interventional technique should be done by the intensive itself. It's very easy, very simple, and this technique should be done preoperatively and intraoperatively by the anesthesiologist and the postoperative period by the ICU personnel. And thank you very much.